Okay, well, we will get started. It's three minutes after the hour, depending on where you are and what hour you are logging in from. My name is Mark Nielsen. I am a uh, REF partner and forum leader for a financial executive firm here in San Diego, California. And I am joined this, uh, this morning by a great panel, uh, the faces you see both on the screen and the faces you see, but also by Ken Warman. Ken is also a executive forum leader in Chester, New Jersey. So welcome, Ken. And so Ken and I will be uh, uh, interviewing, if you will, a little bit of, of our, our panelists. We'll ask questions, but we also encourage everybody, as you think of the questions that you have, to put them in the chat room. And Ken and I will field those as we go along once we get into the Q&A session. Uh, we are very excited to have a great panel this morning. And uh, the theme here today as we finish this year uh, and move into next year is that there is a lot of uncertainty. I think you would all agree that uh, kind of uncertainty has almost become uh, normalcy, not just uh, since COVID started, but all the other things that have rolled into our path along the way. It's really like life in a blender, uh, which is good. It's really tested our agility, but it ain't over. The party, the, the uh, party of the uprise in the economy, I think is over. I think you would all agree with that. Lots of uh, uh, world economists talking about recession, not just in the US, UK, but uh, plenty of other places as well. So I think that's the reality on our doorstep. But I think as we discovered in COVID, it's really not so much about what comes our way, but the agility with which we deal with it. So that's the theme of today is, is a test of your uh, financial and leadership agility. So. Uh, Again, I remind you to put your questions in the chat room. Uh, if you're not already muted and we haven't muted you, please do so yourself. And uh, I wanna kick this off by introducing uh, Brandon Stanford. Brandon is the CFO of Eastridge Workforce Solutions, which is based in San Diego, but has operations uh, around the US. And they are quite a very large staffing and uh, search firm. So they really have their uh, thumb on the pulse what's going on in the labor markets. And believe me, uh, uh, Brandon and his leadership team's agility was tested greatly. <laughs> that might be an understatement, Brandon, uh, when COVID first hit. So uh, huge firm with a, a reach across the US has a pretty good pulse on things. So Brandon, I'm gonna turn it over to you. If you gotta come off mute though, or we're not great at reading lips. Brandon? Yeah, thank you, Mark. I appreciate the, uh, the kind words and the introduction. As CFO of Eastridge Workforce Solutions, uh, we have been exposed to some interesting data points as we've got a great visibility into a diverse set of clients, geographies, and industries. And it's really interesting to see what's happened. Um, you know, as we, as we go through different variables of, of all, that impact our forecasts and our financials, it's really interesting to think about what are some things that we can do to be agile? And that'll be the key word today. Um, and how do we get used to it, right? You know, when I went through the Great Recession, um, everybody was talking about it being a once in a lifetime scenario. Well, a few years later, we have another one. And then a few years later, we have another one, right? So now we've been through multiple once in a lifetime uh, scenarios of volatility. And as Mark alluded to, it's become the norm. So how do we go about ensuring that we are ready for those, uh, for the volatility and also responding appropriately. So I, I've highlighted a few data points or bullet points on the side of what we can do from the financial perspective to ensure that we're ready for this volatility and how to manage through it. So the first point would be, you know, using budgets and forecasts to, um, to understand what's really going on. Now, what I would say is this is the greatest secret of all, all time with CFOs. We love um, finite information and very uh, specific details, but our forecasts are incorrect always from the day they are published, they are incorrect. And we have to know that and live with that, but it also is an important to understand what in those forecasts are really driving your business um, and having a handle on which ones you should really care about and which ones you shouldn't. And so with that, in order to do, to do that, we run scenario planning around a variety of our, our volatile um, components in our forecast. And this is, you know, it's as the data point says here, it's not just for finance. That can be in supply chain, logistics, running all sorts of scenarios and really testing what impacts uh, will will you'll have on your business. Um, now, COVID was kind of an interesting one as it came around. Nobody really knew what was going to happen or expect it to happen. And um, the natural response was to go uh, scorched earth and cut everything. 
Well, we saw that in our client base. We saw that throughout the United States. As, um, it turned out companies, after they realized this was going to be longer, cut too deep and too fast and too deep. Um, they did not, not uh, really respond appropriately. And that's kind of the knee jerk response to this. And so as a staffing agency, what happened was about August of 2020, we started getting a lot of calls about companies that had uh, worked through their forecast and their, um, had responded too violently to uh, their scenarios. And ultimately then they couldn't find staff. And that was really when the, the um, difficulty in finding staff started to show its head in 2020. That's starting to soften out a little bit, but you know, as we talk about those re re reactions to market um, conditions, finding the appropriate response is really the key. Um, running scenarios and testing which ones are the appropriate. Now, the, also the, five, the bullet point on the bottom is underreacting, this wishful thinking component. Now, that's when I think that's kind of when people are thinking that things are going to turn around and they'll be okay. Just wait a little bit longer and they're going to be okay. Well, we never really know, and we need to plan for those appropriately. So from an agile perspective, we need to run those scenarios and really determine what happened, what do we do if they don't turn out? And, that, and having a plan in place well before that occurs is the most critical component. Um, it's a lot harder to make educated and thoughtful decisions when you're making them on game day. So my other recommendation would be as you're working through these scenario plannings, have your responses already pre-planned. If we hit this, this is what we're going to do and communicate it so that everybody understands that. And even though a uh, final bullet point here for me is even though it's in the middle of this point here, communicating with bank and stakeholders probably should be one of the most important aspects. Um, you know, I've worked with a lot of banks over my career, uh, over my career and I've worked through a lot of scenarios and they are much more understanding if they have insight earlier. If they understand what your plans are and they understand what your components are, it's going to be much easier to work with them and they're going to be much more supportive of you when they have to go to their credit committee should you make, need to make any concessions. So overall, you know, what I would say is finance is, is an important tool. It's a strategic driver in, this or, in your organization and it can help you bring normalcy and calm to an otherwise turbulent time. So I, I think if you run scenarios, work with your team and are over communicating, you can definitely have better plans and responding ad hoc. Well, Brandon, thank you for those uh, insights. You guys have certainly been a, a good example of uh, life in a blender the last few years. And I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, and you know this, it's not going to change anytime soon, just different ingredients in the blender. So, uh, so uh, those of you who have questions, uh, a little later on, we're going to open this up for your questions, as well as some that uh, I have for Brandon. Uh, but, you know, I think, Brandon, that was a great tee up for our friend Jay McCabe at Comerica Bank. Uh, Comerica is a what I would call a multi-regional bank uh, headquartered in Dallas with uh, assets of, I think, about eighty five billion dollars, even after the the uh, you know third quarter challenges. So uh, Jay is actually uh, quite involved with REF and uh, anxious to hear his comments on uh, the other side of that. CFO, CEO, banker table. Jay? Great. Hey, thank you, Mark. And uh, it's wonderful to be here with all of you today. I recognize some of the people on the call. And for those I haven't met, uh, great, to, great to see you too. Um, when I put together these comments, Mark, it was, I kind of felt like, God, you know, this really is, is uh, really, really basic from the standpoint of, gosh, maybe everyone online is already doing these things. And if they are already doing these things, then that is wonderful. It, it, it may be surprising to know that if you are already doing all these things, that you're going to be top notch. I mean, it's not it's not that difficult. It kind of comes back to just how do you uh, what are the kind of routines that you have in place as your team? So let's start. I'm going to go through three main things. Number one is getting the right bank. Now, I've heard people say it's all about the banker. It, I mean, I'd love to think it's all about me. No, uh, it, it's the banker and the bank. And the reason why it is the banker and the bank is because your banker, that individual is your advocate to everything the bank has to offer, including access to credit. Now, uh, that person could be uh, remarkably talented, but if they're not with an institution that's comfortable with your company and the industry in which your company operates, you're never gonna get the service that, that you would expect. Uh, they won't be able to deliver. So. Um, it is the banker and the bank that are going to have experience in your industry. And then they're also going to have the right systems and solutions for you and your company. If you're a small or high growth company backed by you know, venture, 
then there's a bank that is suited towards that uh, profile. If you're an international company, you need global treasury. Well, there's a bank that's going to be better at that than others. So again, like really understanding what it is that you need as a company to thrive, that will also inform selecting the right bank. So we're going to now assume that everyone has the right bank. They're with the right banker and the right bank. Okay, so now let's talk about some financial routine. Gosh, I mean, just consistent financial reporting. If you know that you have quarterly reports due uh, 45 minutes, uh, 45 days after uh, the, the quarter end, Gosh, you know, delivering those and saying, hey, listen, um, we're going to deliver those within time frame. Or if you're not saying, hey, we're going to be a couple of days late. It, it, that gives the bank incredible comfort in terms of the systems and routines that you have in place as a company. Again, seems pretty straightforward, but um, you'd be shocked uh, to, you know, in terms of kind of some of the different things I've seen over my career. Also, just knowing your, your loan and your loan covenants. Brandon, you touched on this. When you can come to a bank, Hey, so we're doing forecasting as a company, and we see, see that we're going to be very tight on a specific covenant. Uh, I've had situations where uh, very experienced management teams will come to us, and they'll let us know, hey, this is what we're seeing. This is what we think is likely. Now, that, again, instills great confidence from the bank, because then your banker can go to uh, the, the folks inside the bank that are involved in that credit action and give them a heads up. I would say bad news does not age like fine wine. So you want to get ahead of it once you have some certainty there. And then, of course, just understanding your financing needs. That's why you can prep the bank for an ask. If you're thinking about an acquisition, talking with the bank early and then understanding what are they going to need to be able to deliver on that? Or you need to increase your line of credit. So, okay. So if you're doing all those things, that is fantastic. But then we just talk about like being agile. And that just kind of comes down to relationship management. So it's those ongoing routines, having conversations with your banker, knowing their leadership team. So understanding, here's a great question to ask, who is involved in a credit decision? If you know that, then you know who you should be developing relationships within the bank. And you don't need to go overboard here, but maybe just so you maybe have had a face-to-face -face meeting with that person that's involved in your credit decision. Uh, that, you know, and that there probably will be somebody that's outside of your immediate relationship management. So understanding that it can be incredibly uh, critical, especially in the situation. I mean, what we've been dealing with all this, this last year is supply chain has been flexing. It got extended and now it's corrected. Inventory levels are building. But, you know, a lot of folks, they need to increase the line of credit because they got a lot of inventory. And so if you've d invested in those relationships, the bank will be able to be in a better position to react uh, to that. and and, and and, and quickly. Um, and then in terms of just you know, providing relevant and regular updates, Brandon touched on this. And here's what I would say. I mean, think about the bank as just it's an investor. This is investor relationship. I mean, investor relations. You're not going to communicate everything to your investors. Uh, but when you have a plan and you have uh, solid information that, that you think is going to impact or you know is going to impact the bank, that would be a good time to communicate. So... Uh, if you do these things, again, it seems really kind of a back to basics, but we came through the pandemic and our clients followed these routines and, and it, was, uh, it made it much easier to, to deal with these uncertain times. Yeah, thanks. thanks so much, Jay. You know, I might just add something in there too that I, I think that uh, Brandon and Jay would agree with before we go to uh, our third panelist. Um, and that is oftentimes when people do scenario planning and they're forecasting and they'll present maybe one or two or three different versions to the bank and to the management team, they leave out the balance sheet and cash flow forecasting. Very important. And so I don't think a forecast or scenario planning is complete without a balance sheet, cash flow, and bank covenant forecast. So let's not leave those out. So all yeah, right. Thank let's you, go. Mark. Yep. We'll come we'll uh, so if you have questions for Jay or Brandon, make sure you're putting them in the chat room. Awesome. Uh, Jay, we're really uh, blessed to have you as part of the panel. And there's one banker uh, who chimed in and said he agrees with everything you uh, you just said. So uh, that's the equivalent of a virtual stand up and clap. So um, well, well said. Uh, I get the pleasure of introducing our third panelist, uh, and that is Mike Richardson. So Mike uh, has been a leader in peer groups and building and leveraging collective intelligence 
and the topic of agility, which will be really important for us today for the last 20 years. Um, and most recently, we're really proud to have him as part of our REF team. Um, recently, he did two expert insights. Uh, the first was entitled Thriving in, in Uncertainty, which certainly has relevance to today's discussion. And in the second, Mike, you introduced a, a concept called Agile C2C, Conversation Flow to Cash Flow. So I'd actually like to invite you to join uh, the discussion, introduce yourself, and then you know share yeah. your thoughts. Yeah, thanks. thanks so much, Ken and, and Brandon and Jay. Wow, what great input so far. I'm, I'm making a lot of notes here. And hey, everybody, it doesn't matter whether you are here in the USA or in the UK or somewhere else around the world as, uh, as one of our members or whether you're a non-member. This agility thing has been an exploding universe of inspiration over the last 20 years and before that, actually, and it is mind boggling. And so I've spent the last 20 years trying to get my head and my arms around all of that and just cut through all the hype and all the complexity and boil it down to the most important thing. And it is indeed what um, Ken just talked about. And we've actually had heard Brandon and Jay resonate on so strongly. I call it agile C to C conversation flow to cash flow. In other words, you show me a company with poor cash flow. I will show you a company with poor conversation flow, and it won't take me very long at all to do it. They haven't been talking about the right things in the right way at the right time with the right quantity, quality, and cadence of conversation flow. In particular, when they find themselves in the middle of a recession, they start to realize, oh boy, if only we'd thought about this, that, and the other. If only we'd been driving a more proactive conversation flow while we still had options open to us. If only we'd been considering these scenarios that, um, that uh, Brandon talked about. If only we'd realized... As Brandon said, the moment the ink is dry on our budget and our forecast, we know one thing about it for sure, 100%. It's wrong. So why on earth did we put so much store in this forecast and this budget that we put together? It's a much bigger conversation to unpack. And as you heard, we did a couple of webinars recently really unpacking this, this idea of conversation flow to cash flow. The most pivotal part of conversation flow it all pivots upon the questions that you ask, that idea that questions beat answers. Uh, and, and, and peer forums like ours are a place that you come to get your answers questioned and to be posing pivotal questions that open up new agile thinking like, hey, how do we need to be morphing our business model? Hey, where are we vulnerable and exposed and at risk? Hey, what seems impossible that only, if only we could make it possible would radically transform our future. Everything pivots upon agile questions. And of course, if we're not careful, uh, everybody wakes up to a recession on day one of a recession, which means it's already day 181 before CNN headline news has declared we're in a recession because it takes two quarters of negative growth. What kind of time is that to try to be recession ready? It's almost over. Some of you are in recession right now. Recession is an aggregate thing. And there are some sectors that are already in recession right now. Some will be early, some will be late. So I like to push the idea that, look, we should be recession ready at all times. And what, what scenario thinking, what communication, what, what forecasting and budgeting and covenant and balance sheet and cash flow uh, analysis should we be doing right now, as we've heard uh, in this conversation so far, not just with a plan A, but of course, with a plan B and a plan C and a plan D and a plan E and a plan F, multiple plans that are ready for these multiple scenarios. And you know, the biggest, biggest, biggest mistake that I see in the field of agility, I've seen it so many times in 20 years, is that people assume that they will rise to the occasion. Well, the Navy SEALs have a saying about that. And they say, under pressure, you do not rise to the occasion. You sink to the level of your training, your preparation, and your practice. And so what Jay and Mark and Brandon are all talking about is, hey, let's get limbered up. Be ready for recession now before we need to be because of that idea that when you need a friend, it's too late to make one when you need to have made friends already with scenarios and options and alternates and, and, and a great flow of communication already with your bank and your stakeholders. When you need to make friends with that, it's too late already if you're not careful. 
Uh, look forward to some questions, Mark, back to you. Actually, uh, um, Mike, I'm going to jump in because you just raised the energy level in here. I love it for uh, for good <laughs> morning. Um, I want to probe a little bit further on this um, pivotal agile questions. Um, can you give us a couple of examples for the audience that you got right now on, you know, what do those look like? Because I, I firmly agree. If you ask the right questions, you get a lot of good thought, a good work, uh, and you move yeah. the ball forward. What, yeah, what are some know, questions that people should be asking? Yeah, beyond the ones I, I sort of quickly mentioned earlier, one of my favorites, by the way, is that question. What seems impossible, which if we could only make it possible, would radically transform our future. As Brandon said, you are not about to crack the code of that on game day. The only way you'll crack the code on that is, you know, days, weeks, months, quarters, possibly even years of conversation flow that have been working up towards that, uh, firstly. Secondly, uh, of course, uh, what the, the question of what questions are we not asking ourselves? What questions are sort of big elephants in the corner of the room that for some reason, nobody seems prepared to go there? And even more so, my favorite thing to do when we're off site or we're in, we're in peer forums, and of course, this, a, peer, a peer forum is a great place in which to, to tear apart, you know, your answers and to come up with new questions. But my favorite thing to do when I get people up on their feet is to sit, be brainstorming, hey, what conversation flows are we not having as a team proactively, preemptively enough? And if we're not careful, we will have to have that conversation flow in a panic, in a crisis, because we didn't have it before a crisis to avert a crisis to prevent a crisis. So for me, those are the things that really start to open up the conversation flow, Ken, more broadly and more deeply, and may just allow us to drive right through a recession and say, what recession? I didn't see a recession. We grew right through the recession. Yeah, and I'll just double click on that. The, the um not doing it alone, right? Like be, being able to get with a catalyst or people around you to help you think about those questions that sometimes we get lost in our own minds and we can't come up with ourselves. So I think that's that's awesome. Like, Mark, um, uh, where where do you want to go next uh, with the conversation? Well, um, we got a good question here uh, from one of our uh, members, and uh, the question is, and, and I'll pose this to both Jay and to Brandon. So. I'll let you both weigh in. It says, in a recession, cash is king. Um, so is the most important moniker. So what are some of the other important best practice themes besides just cash is king? So I'll jump in here. Uh, thanks for the question, Bill. I really appreciate it. What I would say is, yes, cash is, is critical, important, and king. But also, if you're positioned uh, well during a recession, uh, if you're just sitting on cash, you may actually be getting a negative return on that. And so there may be opportunities for you to invest appropriately in a recession. And what we found, what I found is a lot of people wait too long to reinvest. So that might be a, a problem. But again, you always want to make sure you have sufficient liquidity. Liquid, I would actually argue liquidity is king versus cash is king. Sl a small nuance on that one. But the other thing that um, we look for when, it, when you're looking at the, you know, kind of these monikers, if you will, um, and best practice is looking for opportunities, right? So if you're thinking a recession is a short term in nature and your company is long term in, in, um, in existence, what are you doing to invest long term? So that's what I would, I would use in a recession. How can I invest and deploy my assets in the most appropriate manner so that I'm ahead of the curve and I'm not waiting to come out of this recession? I'm already well in front of my competition when they wake up and say, OK, we're good to go do business again. Jay, you want to field the same question? Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Uh, cash is king or liquidity is king. Certainly during the pandemic, uh, as that was, you know, just we're in March uh, uh, 2020, we were looking very closely at our clients' balance sheets, you know, the liquidity they had. Uh, that is critical. I'd say one other thing that we are doing uh, more recently through the pandemic is looking at diversity. And what I'm talking about is customer diversity and supply chain diversity. Uh, we've seen challenge, I mean, you have customer concentration and you know that, that, is, that, that, that tends to be a not a very agile business. 
uh, if you're at, at, you know, need to react to the whims of a very, very large customer. And so we're in our underwriting, we're looking at customer diversity. You know, what does the top 10 look like? How long have those relationships been in place? Are they growing? Are they contracting? Same thing on the supply chain side. I mean, if, if, you, if you're sourcing from, from uh, only a few uh, vendors, um, that can be okay. I mean, if you've got great relationships, but again, with the disruption we've seen in China, with lockdowns, I mean, who knows what the future holds? So having that diversification, having that plan B in place, not saying you shouldn't continue to work with those vendors, but being able to pivot or knowing, hey, when China locks down again and I don't have inventory, what is my plan B? So that's a big thing that we're looking at is diversification. Uh, so I have another question here. Uh, in fact, Jay, uh, if you don't mind me uh, picking on you again. So, you know, bank relationships in, in all times, but particularly in volatile times where management's agility is uh, tested and kind of comes to the surface. Uh, how does a bank know that their the management team that they're working with as their borrower relationship has uh agility that thinks ahead that sees the opportunity in in downturns and challenges how do you know that well let's first start with they're doing all the basic things correctly and, and again like like i said earlier like if, if, if you're doing those things you're already top tier now you're going to face some type of challenge and think about like with your best employees do they come to you with a problem and saying how do i solve this or do they come with you to come to you with a problem and then a solution to say, hey, these are the options I'm considering. Same thing with uh, the banking relationship. And so our best, our, our best management teams will have thought these things through when they come to us. Oftentimes they already have the solution. You know your business and your industry better than your bank, believe me, or you should at least. And so it, when, 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 our, when our management teams come to us, they're going to already have usually the solution. And if they don't, they're going to have thought things through and they're going to communicate. So, hey, I, I get it. You know, business is complicated. If they're communicating and, with a plan. And in, in my experience as a CFO for many years, uh, we knew it was our role to educate the bank on things that they may not understand. I mean, they, they understand the industry uh, to some extent, but they're not going to know everything. So I think management has to take ownership in educating uh, the bank about things that they may not understand, you know, whether that's it's right. Bank. So, you know, and, and so I think when, when you, when they're doing that, you feel like they understand it's a relationship where you're, you, the bank is a partner. They're kind of an invisible board member, right? So. Mike, I just want to pull you in on this because what I just heard Jay describe in this solutions mindset and thinking of the problem and then quickly going to the solution seems like agility to me. Um, I'm curious, in your experience, what do what do leaders, what do management teams typically get right or typically get wrong, you know, on this on this uh, agility uh, mindset? Yeah, and that, thanks for asking. And that that's really two sides of the same coin. You know, it's so funny when I when I do keynotes or I do do you know uh, workshops or I speak to ref forums, I build up this sense of anticipation of you know the silver bullet for for agility. And then I, I deliver the answer, which is meetings. And of course, everybody is so disappointed. So what do you mean? I thought I was expecting some kind of silver bullet. And well, it's pretty simple, right? Where does most of your conversation flow happen? Uh, the high stakes, you know, multifunctional, you know, ambiguous, complex, um, uh, you know, execution, uh, challenging uh, issues and decisions that you need to make, they happen in meetings. And uh, you've got an overwhelming number of different avenues and flavors and colors and levels of conversation flow to be driving. And so if your approach to meetings in a business isn't working very well, it's going to be a source of fragility, not agility. And if you can adopt a more agile approach to meetings that is flowing better, uh, not perfectly, nothing is ever perfect. In Agile, you accept the fact that nothing's ever perfect. But if you're getting more right than you're getting wrong, then you can be, you, the, wherever the trajectory of your conversation flow goes, the trajectory of your cash flow follows. 
and and how 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 painful is it with 2020 hindsight to point out to people well yeah it's not surprising that your cash flow has hit bottom because you guys have been over talking about this and under talking about that for days weeks months possibly even years in some cases decades just look at ge right now general electric that used to be held up as an icon of american industry and now it's its share price is at rock bottom and one of the things i say to people is you know if you had a share price i mean most most of you are probably private companies but if you did have a share price as a public company and the analysts had wired your room for sound and they were listening in to your conversation flow with a real time graph on the on the lcd tv of your share price what i like to ask people at the end of every meeting is did your share price go up or down as a result of this meeting and that really brings into focus wow we better focus on the meetings structure flow cadence that we have to drive our conversation flows as a source of agility not fragility so uh mike great great point on meetings and um so let's uh, use brandon as an example here uh so, Brandon, you guys do have a share price because, as I understand it, in your very large ESOP employee-owned company, so you do have a share price, an internal one. But so tell us about um, what changed maybe back uh, when COVID first started, but has that changed the way your meeting agenda, the conversations in those meetings? Uh, talk about that as far as within your company through your eyes. Sure. Yeah, you're right. As an employee owned organization, we take great pride and value in creating that value for our employees and their long term uh, financial welfare. Um, with respect to meetings, you know, it's really interesting. The natural response is probably they are going to change. But I, I think about this. Uh, I, I read a book, Extreme Ownership, once, and it was talking about this, uh, this military operation was about to take off and they were re all ready to go. And then all of a sudden somebody comes in with a new bit of information. Um, they, you know, that they didn't have. And they, the question was, well, do we cancel the operation because we have this new information and this is what they would do in their training. And, you know, they, he went on to say, you know what? No, we're not going to cancel because we've already planned and we have to, we don't, even if that information is real or not. So my guidance and direction with meetings is number one, uh, when COVID came along, the number of meetings went up uh, dramatically because of that was the only way you could interact. You could no longer have the, uh, the water cooler comments, but the efficiency of them went down and ju just in general. And so I would say be really conscientious and cautious about your meetings. They are critically important. But as Mike shared, the outcome is, you know, do, if people walk away and say that was just a big waste of my time there, it's just it's not worth it. Now, what I would say is um, back in line with that preparation, if you're not taking the same level of intensity on your on your meetings and your forecasting and planning, especially around the strategy side, then you're probably not putting enough emphasis into it. Um, again, that game day decision is too, you're too late. So my guidance and what we did is um, we still have the, the same level of cadence. Uh, we've learned to improve them. And I would say we become much more efficient at the outcome and also ensuring before a meeting ends, we determine who is doing what by when. That's really critical. If you don't have that call to action or action item out of a meeting, you probably just wasted everybody's time in that inside that room. And unless it was a brainstorming, but even then you would have a, okay, when are we meeting again? What are our follow-up points and how do we make this and improve our organization? So if it's just information session, send it an email, let them do it on their own time. Yeah, I would double down on that, uh, Brandon, and I'm on a number of corporate boards and I insist that we start every meeting with last time's action items and we end the meeting with this time's action items, just so that uh, action uh, happens and not just meetings, and which is why people say, oh, I hate meetings. So Jay, meetings are critically important uh, in all times, but particularly in times of uncertainty. Uh, so tell, tell us what best practices are for companies with their, their banks. So uh, they don't have these long gaps or someone says, well, we're 10 days late with our financials. And that's all they say. Yeah, a great question. I, I mean, I, I see a range you know, from, from my clients. I mean, I have, I have clients that send me a monthly update, uh, almost like an investor relations update on kind of the key drivers in that month. Um, that's on the most frequent side. Um, on the, on the other end, it could be, they're still sending their financials in compliance with the, the loan agreements, but maybe we're meeting twice a year. 
Um, in, in either case, and, and kind of like in between as well, it, 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 it's, it's having those kind of whatever those routines are for you and your company, maintain those routines. Because I mean, your, your banker is just going to want to uh, interface probably at least twice a year. Um, and, and, and they're also going to want to match what, what fits with you. At the, at the end of the day, it's like, are you communicating enough so that when things are maybe not ideal, they, you know who to call and, and the bank has the ability to take action. I'll add one other thing that I really like to, to understand. First strategic and then more operational. For all my clients when communicating, I like to know, hey, what are their top three to five things that they're trying to achieve in the next several years? That way I can stay on point on the things that I'm delivering to them that, that's on target. Uh, if I know they're trying to ex extend internationally, make an acquisition of a competitor, these types of things. These are big things that I like to kind of keep, I like to keep in mind. Then on the operational side, just as you're having those updates, giving the bank and the banker kind of those macro level drivers in your business, revenue, profitability, cost. The, these are just talking points. Allow me, again, of investor relations to be your advocate, uh, you know, within the bank. So, so those are kind of the routines and then some of the topics. Yeah, so I, I think, Jay, you would agree that one of the biggest mistakes people make when uh, either their industry or they themselves are struggling uh, in times of uncertainty is not meeting with the bank. It's the opposite of what you should do, which is, listen, bankers understand, you know, business is a whitewater ride and they're in it too. So, you know, get their advice. They're a, they're a free board member. I mean, it comes with the package. And if you avoid them, you're actually probably aggravating a situation you didn't have to. So no um, question. The unknown unknown is the worst. Yep. So even if it's challenging, you know, I remember I, I did a turnaround uh, or I was part of a turnaround of a, of a logistics company in the Midwest. We had weekly meetings with which I instigated with the bank. So that, you know, we could show them that, yeah, we're micromanaging right now because that's what's called for. And it gave them great comfort to know that. And some meetings, it was not much to talk about, but that was okay. But we, and we went to their office and then every other meeting, they would come to our office. And it was a reflection that we're in this together. So, um, right. okay, well, actually we can open this up uh, to some verbal questions. If any of our um, members or guests have any questions and you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, now's a good time to do that. And if not, we do have a couple more questions that I think Ken and I have for our panelists, but uh, for the moment, I'd just like to hear from any of our members, anything that's been said or things on your mind. That Mark, you'd like hey, to Mark, can you uh, give my video so I can tell you I'm raising my hand? Uh, well, we don't need to raise your hand, John, just go ahead. What's your question? Uh, a, a question for Jay. What What is your, um, oh, I don't know, preferred cadence with customers in this agile world? Is it a monthly, monthly, quarterly? What What do you think is the best practice for you and your credit long, credit customers? Yeah, I mean, I think probably quarterly is is probably the best practice. You know, okay. again, as things uh, are disrupted, more dynamic. I mean, I've had situations like Mark described where we're meeting on a weekly basis. That is not the norm. Quarterly right. is the norm, and you know, and if you're if you're if you and your clients are providing those quarterly financials, if that's what's required, and that update, that will go a long ways to instilling confidence within the bank. Okay. Hey, um, yeah, and those those, uh, those statements are not worth anything on their own without some commentary to go with them. It, it's a story and the numbers support the story and vice versa. Mark, if I may jump in from the CFO side, what's been really interesting, you know, um, we've been contemplating different transactions over the years or different um, items. You know, you talk about this communication and yes, there is the preparation for the downturn, but also when you're going on the offensive and looking at acquisitions, um, I've, I've found that the banks ask really great questions of maybe something I haven't considered. So, you know, checking in at, on, on those types of questions, hey, what are you guys thinking about? Or, or if we were to do this, what would be your response? And they help us um, refine some of our forecasting to really make it a meaningful. And it's in, in many cases, it's helped us create value on our transaction as well. So I, I agree. Look at them as partners, not as uh, just as somebody that gave you some money at some time. You got to keep them 
uh, up to date. So these are strategic partners in your uh, ecosystem. Okay, any questions, any more questions? Uh, great one, John, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Ken. Mark, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. So Mike, I'm, I'm hopeful now we have people self-reflecting upon you know, their meetings, their conversations. And, and what if upon that self-reflection, it's, wow, our meetings actually aren't as rich. We've gotten into a bad habit around that, or our conversations are not really all that agile or proactive as Brandon and Jay suggest. Um, wh where do we start? What what yeah. what is something foundational where we can change that and and just start to implement change around that? Yeah, thanks for asking. And I think you know Brandon started to take us there, and I'm sure Jay does too. In that you've got to bring more design to the matrix, the portfolio of meetings. You spend a lot of time designing everything else in business, products and services and processes, etc. Well, meetings is one of the most mission critical things that you can do to be more agile. And how do you bring more design to it and design a, a, a stack of less frequent meetings, your annual strategic retreat, quarterly, monthly, weekly, frankly, even daily meetings, right? Scrum like meetings uh, that are at the heart of agile leadership. And the more firefighting that you can get done in that daily meeting or that weekly scrum, then the less of it you have to do in your, your bi-monthly meeting or your monthly meeting or your bi-quarterly meeting or your quarterly meeting, whatever it is. So those meetings can actually talk about what they're supposed to talk about. Most quarterly meetings are not quarterly meetings at all because they spend the first half talking about what happened last month. And, and so because we're trying to get the firefighting done first, we don't actually get fully to the agenda that we should. So taking a hard look at the design of your meetings portfolio, your meetings matrix from most, um, most frequent to least frequent. And, you know, when I do workshops on this kind of stuff, Ken, I ask the audience, when agile leaders get busier with more to juggle in less time, do they have more meetings or less meetings? Of course, the audience typically says less because they have less time in which to do it. Wrong answer. When life gets faster and busier, when the clock speed of change increases, then agile leaders know there's only one way to go, and that is to increase the clock speed of our communication, coordination, and collaboration as a team, we have to, our clock speed has to be operating inside the clock speed of change. Otherwise, we're going to live in disorganized chaos. And the only place in which to live is inside because that can be organized chaos. We understand that life is going to be chaotic. How can it not be? But there's a world of difference between disorganized chaos and organized chaos. And that is something that agile leaders understand. And they understand how to design their matrix, that portfolio of meetings to be up to that agile challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times in coaching sessions, people just say, yeah, I'm in meetings all the time and they're sort of useless. And I think it starts with just a lack of planning, a lack of, lack of intentionality, a lack of having good questions, you know, that we're trying to solve in those, in those meetings. So great points. Um, how about other questions from the audience? Anybody want uh, to dive in here? While we have these three panelists rolling, uh, anybody have other questions they want to put in the chat or just take yourself off mute and ask them if you'd like. Uh, hi, guys. Yeah, go sorry. Ahead. yeah, this is Bill Ness. Um, first of all, thanks, guys. Great, great presentation. Um, very timely. Um, thank you. Um, I, I like metrics, right? So, you know, there's financial metrics and then there's operations metrics. And if if meetings are not working the best way possible, you know, oftentimes maybe we can create ranges and accept acceptable ranges, acceptable data that, you know, frankly, if if the numbers are, uh, if the numbers and the metrics are telling us one thing, but we're saying something different, then then it's probably a um, a sign that we've either got to change our metrics or and update them, or we're not acting on the metrics. Can you talk for a minute or two about? Um, financial and operations metrics that really can drive the discussion, I would think. Maybe, uh, Brandon, that would seems like a good one for you to start. Sure. Well, thanks, Bill. Appreciate the question. Yeah, metrics are, are critically important. And as you alluded to, um, they're all just data points, right? And so what it, the first thing I would say is, what, what are you measuring and are they act, is there any volatility associated with them? 
you, know, you may have a 15% decrease in your, uh, in your business, uh, but this metric, whatever metric you're looking at may show no volatility at all. Well, that's a worthless metric for you. And you're right that you would need to change it. Right. So, uh, the, uh, the first guidance I would say is how are you reporting it and what X, uh, what visibility do you really have? Like, do you have any type of dashboarding that you can look at on a daily, weekly, whatever basis? And then also, um, what are you doing to identify trends, right? Because uh, is there deterioration? Is there improvements? And as specifically, when you start making changes to your operations, are your metrics responding? Um, yeah, I think it was Mullaly that came and spoke about this quite a bit. You know, um, people had these metrics, and they all, he went in, and, and they all looked, they were all green when he first went in there, um, but the business was doing terrible. Right, so I, it, in that case, they were living on a false sense of security. So again, it, it's really about what metrics are you using that are specific to your business. For example, as a service industry, inventory does nothing for me. However, my clients' inventory is really critical, and as they work through it, they are going to have demands that are going to impact it. So, even though it's not a KPI that impacts us, we're looking at industry metrics as well. So I would say, you know, there's very critical metrics inside your industry or inside your company you need to be watching for the trends, and then also industry metrics as, as well that impacts your clients. Mike? Yeah, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm sure Brandon and Jay would agree with this, that if we're not careful, we often measure what's easy. We don't measure what's difficult. And, and oftentimes it's the less tangible things, of course, that are the most difficult to measure, which is why at the end of the day, if all you can do is that sort of whites to the eyes, go around the room, did our share price go up or down and making it safe for someone to say down and then it's safe for you to ask them, why do you say that? Well, because I think that our conversation flow kind of derailed over there and was so focused on this metric, but the metric is incomplete. It's out of date. It's an old paradigm. So I couldn't agree more with what Brandon said. You, ha you have to do your level best with your metrics and keep in mind that obviously many things are really hard to measure and you're left really with just the ability to, you know, can you take a pulse in some way, shape or form to get a sense? Because at the end of the day, you're dealing in hope and belief, right? You know, can we, can we believe that we can out agile the future in with all the new and novel stuff that's coming at us, you know, right? There is no data, right? Nobody's ever been down this road before. So yeah, just adding, just adding a little uh, on top of what Brandon said, and I see him nodding his head there that he would agree with that. Well, great stuff. I uh, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Jay and Brandon. Uh, I'm going to let each of you kind of think about what you uh, want. One big takeaway. So uh, we're gonna jump to takeaways here and see uh, what each of our panelists wanna leave you with besides some of the great things they've already commented on. Also, before they do that, I'll just mention, uh, I should have mentioned this, shame on me at the beginning. You'll notice we have a different logo and a different name. Uh, you'll be seeing more of this, those of you who are members, those of you who are future members, um, will be seeing this name REF, which is not an acronym for what was known as Renaissance Executive Forums. It is REF and new logo, new look. Uh, so you'll be hearing more about that as the weeks roll by. So we look forward to sharing that with you and why we're doing all that. But uh, Jay McCabe, I want to want to start with you. What uh, what would you want our audience uh, to remember if, if everything else was forgotten from your comments? Know your loan agreement and get your reporting on time. That's If you can do that, you're going to be top tier. Great stuff. Brandon. Volatility is an opportunity for improvement. Use this time to be able to actually grow your business. I heard a banker recently say, I love a great recession because it, it <laughs> basically challenges management to step up, you know, because anybody can surf, even me, in high tide. But when the, when the tide rolls back, then you find out who's really uh, good at leadership. So uh, speaking of agile leadership, Mike, bring us home. <laughs> Yeah, when you need a friend, everybody, it's too late to make one. Start making friends right now with everything you've heard from Jay, with everything you've heard from Brandon, with everything you've heard from me about meetings, meetings, 
meetings. And Mark touched upon uh, another idea. He talked about micromanagement. Micromanagement has a bad reputation in business, but there are two kinds of micromanagement. There's bad micromanagement, which you all know so well, and there's good micromanagement. It's so good, we can even call it micro-leadership. And Brandon touched upon one of the most famous stories of all of how Alan Mulally turned around Ford with micro leadership. There's a whole book written about it. The way that you implement micro leadership is to have that stack of meetings all the way down to the most frequent meetings that you need to be having to be ahead of the curve in organized chaos, not behind the curve in disorganized chaos. Amen. All right. Great takeaways. And I'll also just let you know that we did record this session. So whether you want to listen to it again for some reason, or you want to share this with a colleague, uh, or another member or someone that you think would benefit from it, uh, we will make this available. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Lisa Wing from REF Corporate, who's going to give us some uh, closing comments. I just want to thank all of you uh, members and those of you who future members uh, for joining us today. Video. Lisa, you're on mute. There you go. Hello, everyone. Thank you for this wonderful meetup. My name is Lisa Wing. I'm community lead at um, REF. Just wanted to reach out and say hi to everybody and thank you for being here today. I believe and I hope you agree that this meetup is a great example of the valuable takeaways and insights that come from coming together, even if it's online and tapping into our collective intelligence, which is the pillar of our organization, leaders powered by collective intelligence. Or like Mike said, the value and agile meetings. I hope you found this meeting agile and have some great take home value from what came out of this meetup. And second, I would like to invite our REF members to join our finance network. We're just officially launching our networks through our app. So we're really excited about this. We already have our manufacturing network and our finance network is our official second, second network, which as I mentioned, we're doing it through our app. So, um, you know, it's a great way to reach out to other members in our global community that are in the same industry as you guys. And just, you know, keep updated with the upcoming events. You know, we're gonna have a number of uh, meetups similar to these panel discussions or expert insights or some other form of meetups where we can come together and, and discuss relevant topics. So this will be a great way to keep informed. And then also I'd like to invite our non-members or future members <laughs> to um, you know, reach out to whoever invited them. If it's you, you know, you've been here and you enjoyed it and you want to learn more about what we're all about. So please reach out to the person that um, invited you to get more information. And you're also welcome to reach out to me. Um, Aitana will go ahead and put my contact in the chat as well. Um, so Lisa, we have I would slide. also like to, I'd like to add something, Lisa, thank you. Um, and that is, I forgot to mention, I, you know, I'm a horrible facilitator, that's obvious because I missed a couple of things. But one of them is that this was the first uh, of what will be a, a cadence of finance network events uh, sponsored by uh, REF. So um, you have all been part of the first one. So you can put that on your resume. And uh, again, we hope to have you back for others and that you would invite others. And uh, this one will be recorded as well. So you can show, share it. So uh, glad you're all aboard the, the maiden voyage of the ship. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that, Mark. Yeah, we're definitely looking forward to being um, you know, following up with not just having these meetings as a one-off deal, but being able to reach out to other participants one-on-one -on -one and a great way to do this is through the network. So we definitely encourage members to sign up. Um, so we have a, a, a screenshot that has what the app is going to look like, just so you know what to expect. So when you go into the app, which can be, um, you know, downloaded from the app store or Google Play as ref slash global, but you go into the menu and then you would go into the groups. And then in the groups, you would go into the uh, networks which are, which are down below. And then in the networks, you'll see the finance network there as well as a manufacturing network, which you're also welcome to join if it interests you. And the idea is to grow these networks, not only by industry and business, but eventually um, to personal um, networks as well. So this is something we're really excited about. We're doing a lot of new things and this is one of the meetups that as uh, Mark had mentioned, that it's the first time that we're having this mix of members and non-members. So we hope that 
um, you know, you've enjoyed it as much as we have. And, and thank you for participating. And also thank you very much for our panelists, for the organizers. Um, and, and please feel, re you know, feel free to reach out to anybody um, if you have any further questions. Um, um, Aitana is going to put my email in the um, in the chat as well. So thank you for being here. I don't know if you want to go ahead and close it out, Mark, with just with no, we're good. I just wish everybody, everybody. Uh, <laughs> wish everybody a good rest of your day and the upcoming holidays. Uh, uh, be safe and be agile. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Bye-bye, everybody. Be agile. Goodbye.